You know, you can't live without water. In an emergency, it's going to be the first thing on your mind. Do I have enough water? In a future episode of the 521 Preparedness Plan, we'll look at water purification. But for right now, one to two weeks of water storage in your home should be sufficient to get you through most emergencies, so you don't even have to worry about purifying water during an immediate crisis. So how much water are you gonna need? Well, FEMA recommends one gallon per person per day for drinking, cooking, and sanitation. And that sounds about right to me based upon our water usage during camping trips. So for our family of four, for one week, that'd be about 28 gallons, or you could round it up to 30 if you want. So what's it gonna take to get 30 gallons of water? Okay, here we are at Walmart. Let's go in and see. Five gallons of water storage for a little over five bucks. You try and find a food grade five gallon water container, and you're gonna pay oh, I don't know, 15, 20, 25 bucks, something like that. So this is a really inexpensive way to do water storage. So it'd take about six flats for our family of four to have a one week supply. And that would cost only about 32 bucks or so if you got it at Walmart, like we were just looking at. And then you'd have a one week supply of water with a relatively almost indefinite shelf life. Now the one drawback is that you wouldn't have containers that are easily refillable if you ended up needing to go to a water source and refill the containers and bring them back home. This wouldn't be ideal for that. So in that kind of a scenario, it might not hurt to have one or two five gallon containers that are food grade, you know, ready for water storage. For a more advanced option, you can get a food grade 55 gallon uh, barrel or drum to store water in. Uh, sometimes you can find these used, um, like for example this one, I believe it used to have like fruit juice concentrate in it for large companies, but you can buy them new also. So you'll want to find um, something that's food grade, uh, rain barrel or water storage container, um, and then <clears throat> be sure that you store these in a cool place that's out of the sun, because then um, that will discourage growth and things in the water that you don't want. Um, also be sure that you disinfect the container really well before you store your water in it. And then you'll want to rotate that water through the barrel, um, like I think once every six months or so. And the ultimate, if you have property, would be to have an underground cistern like this buried uh, where you have a large amount of water capacity and it stays cool and it cuts off sunlight where the potential for growth is greatly diminished in there. And that's an awesome route to go. But even if you do something like this, uh, if you're not using the water as part of your regular water system where it's constantly getting rotated, then you would want to manually rotate it every now and then by you know, emptying it out and putting fresh water in or treating it, something along those lines. You've probably experienced this just before or after a big storm. If you're like most folks, you have some food in your pantry, but not enough to last very long. The average American family buys groceries almost twice a week. So think of how often you have to go to the grocery store and that'll give you a feel for how stocked up your pantry is. How long could you feed your family if the grocery store was cleaned out or your ability to even get there was gone? or your ability to purchase food was gone. Everyone's situation is different, but think of how much money you could spare right now to bulk up your pantry. Maybe it's just $50 or $500, or maybe you even have $1,500. Whatever it is, especially if your budget's tight, you'll wanna maximize the amount of food you buy with that money and focus on the foods that make filling meals, the kinds that stick to your ribs. But this is important. You don't wanna buy food that's just gonna sit and go bad. We advocate for a rotating pantry. Eat what you store and store what you eat. So you wanna consider the meals that your family typically enjoys and stock up on those foods, especially the most cost-effective ones. For us, that would be items like rice and beans, which we often eat in different forms. Pasta, you know, oats for breakfast in various forms, like cooked oats or granola and so on. These are foods that are relatively inexpensive they're filling and we enjoy them on a regular basis. 
I know the price of food has really skyrocketed lately, and you may be thinking that stocking up your pantry is gonna cost a fortune, and it certainly could, but I wanna show you how far even a relatively small $50 budget can go. So we headed to our local Walmart with a challenge. Now, I don't like shopping at Walmart, but when you're tight on money, it's one of the best places to pinch your pennies. So let's see how many days of shelf-stable food we could stock up if all we could spare is $50. How far do you think it's gonna go? Okay, here we are at Walmart. Let's go in and see. So what does $50 of food look like? Well, you just looked at it. So we've collected the items and I've tallied it all up here on my phone. And here we are, $49.77 for the food that I have here in my cart. Now, how how far, like how long is this going to last us? So we just calculated up the numbers of servings. I know how many cups of dry beans it takes to fill a quart, and I know how much my family would typically eat in a meal um, with the rice also. Um, there's, I think we figured there was about 40 meals between the rice and the beans here. Then there's two weeks of quick oats, two weeks worth of quick oat meals here. And then my family really likes pasta, so about one box and one can per meal, so that's another four meals there. We figured this would easily feed our family for two weeks. You know, this is assuming you've got some salt and some seasonings and things at home that you can season this stuff with. So $50 could buy enough food to cover our family of four staples for two weeks. And we live in an area with fairly high cost of living, so your $50 might go even further than ours did if you're careful. The reason it's important that you only buy food that you enjoy is because you'll be eating this food in a month or two and then replacing it with fresh supplies in order to keep it rotated and fresh. Once again, yours is gonna look different than ours. And if you, like we, try to eat a higher quality of food, such as organic for some things, it could certainly cost more than this. But I just want you to see what's possible even in this expensive era that we live in. And that two weeks of food could get your family through many storms or disasters that you're likely to encounter. You'll just need to have some seasonings and a way to cook stuff like your rice and beans. For that, a simple camp stove with several spare fuel canisters can fit the bill. This is our ultralight backpacking stove that runs on butane, and it'll work just fine. But something bigger like an old Coleman stove could probably be even better, especially if it runs on propane, which doesn't go bad. Just make sure you stock up on fuel cylinders for whatever stove you plan on using. And remember, if you have to boil your water to purify it, you'll be using a lot more fuel than expected. The time you're most vulnerable is when you're away from home on the road. So why not make some simple preparations that'll equip you to handle these kind of challenges? So let's start with basic necessities. The first thing that you need to make sure you have in your car is water. And of course, we always carry our water bottles with us, but that's not always quite enough water. We always like to keep an extra gallon Yeti jug in the car. It's insulated, but you do wanna make sure that you clean it out periodically and don't leave it in the car if it's gonna freeze. The last thing is you could throw one of those great big packs of water bottles in the back of your car that we found at Walmart on day one. That provides almost five gallons of water. And if you have the space, it's a great way to go. For food, you want shelf stable items that can handle the heat and the cold all right. For instance, trail mix, nut bars, and some of our favorites, we like these madras lentils that are already cooked and prepackaged, healthy protein. Anything like that is gonna be a huge help to keep you going for a day or two if you got stuck in your car. For heat, some items you want to include would be a nice warm wool blanket, perhaps a sleeping bag if you're in really cold country. Throw in some warm clothes that you can change into, especially if you break down. Something that takes little to no space in your car is a pack of hand warmers. You can warm these up and throw them in your shoes or your gloves. And lastly, make sure you have the proper tools, like maybe a shovel to dig yourself out of a ditch. Gotta have a good set of tools. 
case something breaks, you need to fix it, or even if you don't know how to fix it, maybe somebody who stops to help you will, and they'll need your tools. A good tow strap and shackle is important in case you get stuck or you need to pull somebody else out. A heavy duty set of jumper cables. And I like to take a battery powered chainsaw in case trees fall down over the road and you need to cut your way out, which has happened many times for us. Or this is a low cost alternative, just take an ax, but it's more work. And there's a uh, battery powered air compressor. These are invaluable. And I really like the new ones that have a jump starter built in. That's awesome. And that's what I'd like to upgrade to someday. And finally, duct tape, the handyman's secret weapon, and zip ties. You'd be amazed what you can do with this stuff. Another thing you need to think about is survival gear for your car. A good sheath knife, a life straw, or some, some way to filter water, um, a ferro stick. It's, it's really good. Parachute cord, and maybe even a compass or other survival gear that your car should have. For communications, of course, you want to have a phone on hand and a phone charger. And we like to have two-way radios in case we get separated. Um, also, you can have a CB radio in your car or something like that. That can be useful. You, the uh, newer iPhones, like iPhone 14 and newer, can do satellite-based SOS messages if you're in an area that doesn't get cell signal. And it's also not a bad idea to have printed maps in your car, if you, unless you know the area like the back of your hand. And you can even download Google Maps, a whole region of maps to Google Maps on your phone so that you can use it offline in areas with no signal. For security, it's a good idea to have a good flashlight on hand and some spare batteries and some small cash. You never know when your card isn't gonna work. And also something for personal defense isn't a bad idea. Whatever you are trained for and is legal and makes sense in a car. Every car should have a very good first aid kit. In one of our future 521 episodes, we'll talk more about the first aid kit. But for today, just make sure you have a good one in your car. Also, we like to keep electrolytes, probiotics, and tea tree oil in the car wherever we go. Also, if you're someone who wears contacts, be sure and throw your glasses in. Don't ask me how I know. Did you know that there have been more hypothermia cases in the 30 to 50 degree range than in colder temperatures? And interestingly, you can die faster from cold exposure than starvation or even thirst. So heat needs to be a pretty important part of your preparedness plan. So how do you stay warm in a power outage? First, the most obvious answer would be to have a fireplace or a wood stove like this. If you already have one, then this would not be a problem for you. If you're able to install one, do it. But if that's not an option for you, let's look at some low cost and easy options. If a wood stove isn't feasible for you, there are some non-electric heating options out there. Not a lot, but there are some. This is one, for instance, it is a direct vent propane heater that is permanently installed, thermostatically controlled, and it's completely non-electric. However, something like this is gonna be more on the pricier side of things. And in this series, we're trying to focus on quick and easy and cheap options. And so there are some portable propane heaters out there that are non-electric. You've probably seen Mr. Heaters like this. This particular style, however, is not rated for indoor use. It's not indoor safe. So you wanna make sure you find a indoor safe heater. And I know that Mr. Heater and perhaps some others do make some indoor safe portable units. And then you just wanna make sure that you've got enough fuel on hand to get you through the whatever length of time that you might need to keep your home warm for. Unless sunlight is pouring in your windows, your windows are one way that your house will lose a lot of heat quickly, especially if your windows are older like ours are. So just grab a warm blanket and cover your window really well like this and you would be surprised at how much heat you can save in your home by just covering over your windows with a blanket. We do this in the winter here to keep our bathroom warmer. When you're cold during a disaster, there's nothing like a good old warm, thick blanket or a bunch of them. Our favorites are these military wool blankets. They're very inexpensively priced for what you're getting. 
and you know nice warm wool that stays warm even when it's wet you know stays reasonably warm and uh, they're tough and we were able to get a whole pack of them for a good price but even individually they're still quite reasonably priced for for what you're getting and you may already have sleeping bags and if you do that's a great thing to have it for if it's a warm sleeping bag can keep you nice and toasty at night even if your heat is off and our favorite brand is the Wiggies sleeping bags but there's other good ones too you want synthetic that'll stay warm even when it's wet and if you don't have the the money to buy new sleeping bags you can buy used on places like Facebook marketplace uh, it's a great option for finding good deals for things like that on day two we talked about having a camp stove well if you're cold and you're trying to get warm boil a pot of hot water and dump it into your water bottles and then you can use that to tuck it down into your sleeping bag to warm up or hold it in your hands and drink some to get warmed up Another way to keep warm is to have these wonderful little hand warmers or foot warmers. Look at that, instant heat up to 10 hours. So that's a great thing and it takes up little to no space. One strategy is to make small spaces so that you don't have to heat as much space and you can keep it warmer. For instance, if you have a tent, you could pitch that tent in your house and that makes less space to heat and it'll keep you a little bit warmer like it does outside when you're camping or you could use a small room like a closet or, or something like that where it's less space to heat or better still, do a blanket fort. With all those blankets that we've collected, you guys staying warm in there? <laughs> Very hot. So take a quick look around you and make sure you have what you need to keep your family warm when things go sideways. When you're in the eye of the storm, it takes a lot more than just stuff to get you through. Today in the 521 Preparedness Plan, we're looking inside at something more foundational than even basic necessities of life. All the water, all the food, all the heat, even all the medical supplies, all these things are important and necessary. But simply having these things is not enough to bring us through the difficult times that are ahead of us. When you're in the middle of a disaster and it seems like all the forces of nature are bent on your destruction, what are you going to hang on to? When you take a stand for something that you believe in, in this polarized world, what are you going to do when you're canceled and you lose your job and all your friends turn against you and it feels like the system is ready to crush you? In times like these, we have to turn to our faith. because. These problems are bigger than we are, and only God can surround them. And thankfully, we don't have to bear them alone. So I want to share some Bible promises that you can hang on to the next time your world is turned upside down and you don't know which way to turn. Just look up. And I want to share with you one of my dad's favorite verses from 1 Peter. It says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice, inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. And remember, when you're going through a fiery trial like this, God never promised that you wouldn't go through the fire. What he did promise is that he would be there with us through it all. Think of Isaiah 43 verse 2 says, when thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. Hmm. You remember Daniel chapter 3, the story of his three friends. They were standing for their faith against the might of the empire. And don't forget that they were not saved from the fire. They went through it, but Jesus was there with them, and that made all the difference. But one thing that we don't often remember is that they went into that fire without knowing that God was there. They probably felt very alone, but when Nebuchadnezzar issued his command, they had to enter that fiery furnace in faith. And only once they were in the fire did they find that Jesus was personally there with them. And so it is with us. At the moment of greatest discouragement, we have to trust in God that 
he is there with us, even though it might not feel like he is. We have to believe that he is there. You know, I think of a quote from an amazing commentary on the life of Christ, and it says this, To all who are reaching out to feel the guiding hand of God, the moment of greatest discouragement is the time when divine help is the nearest. Hmm. I just love that reminder. God is right there. So as you face your great trial, whether it's happening right now or whether it's coming in the future, I would encourage you to trust that God is there with you through it all, even if sometimes it feels like He isn't. Mm -hmm. Psalms 23 verse 4 says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for Thou art with me. <laughs> and I'll leave you with the words of Jesus, And lo, I am with you always even unto the end of the world. That's what makes all the difference. He is there with us always. On day one of the 521 Preparedness Plan, we showed you ways to bulk up your water storage ability. What if your water storage runs out before the water is back on, though? My family experienced this years ago when a flood took out the municipal water system for like three weeks. Back then, we were dependent on FEMA to bring us gallon jugs of water. But I just got to ask you, are you really comfortable depending upon FEMA and betting your family's survival on them bringing you water? Disasters come at a time when water can be scarce and the water that's around may not be drinkable. But there are a number of ways to purify water. And in this episode, we're going to look at ones that are easier, more convenient, and lower cost. And then at the end, we'll also discuss some more advanced options. So the first thing we're going to look at is options that are available to anyone. So if you're going to find water, you want to try and find the cleanest, freshest, clearest water that you can. But whatever water that is, you're still going to need to filter out debris as much as possible. So I've got a pot and a cloth, and I'm just going to put this cloth over. If you can find a rubber band or something that you can fit around it to just help you hold that in place, that's great or tie a belt or something around it, or just try and hold it as best you can. So I'm gonna filter this through the cloth and it's gonna to help to collect the debris out of the water. Once we've filtered that out, there's all the stuff that we can't see that can make us really sick in the water still. Um, and so boiling is gonna be your best option if you have no other options around. Um, if you have that camp stove that we've talked about, you can boil it on a camp stove um, from super cold water. We took about one gallon and it took us around nine minutes to bring it to a complete boil. You wanna make sure that you boil your water for at least one minute. Um, if you're above 5,000 feet, it's more like three minutes, um, but it doesn't take long to kill all of the bacteria and things in there that's gonna give you uh, a lot of issues. Now, recognizing that this is not going to remove chemicals um, out of the water, it's only going to kill anything that's alive or that could make you sick in the water. One last quick note on boiling water. Water can taste kind of flat after you've boiled it. So you can add a pinch of salt to your water to help give it better flavor. Or the other option is you can dump your water back and forth between containers to help aerate it and give it more of a delicious taste. Another option is to boil it on your wood stove if you have one, or you can build a fire outside and boil your water on the fire. Boiling is your primary option, but if for whatever reason that's not feasible, another thing that almost anybody can do with something that they have in their home is to use regular household bleach and if that's what you've got, then you can treat water. So first of all, just like with boiling, you're gonna to wanna to filter any sediment out because, and this is especially important with bleach because it can't do its work if there's sediment in the water. So let it settle, pour it through a cloth, whatever it takes to get it clear. Then we can use the CDC guidelines, uh, which are kind of middle of the road guidelines of almost 1 8 teaspoon of bleach per one gallon of water. It's teaspoon, not tablespoon. So we didn't 
have a one eighth teaspoon in our house or we couldn't find it. And so what we're doing is we're doubling that. We've got two gallons of water here. And we have a one quarter teaspoon. And so I'm gonna go just under one quarter teaspoon. I'm not gonna fill it up all the way. I'm gonna do just under that. I'm gonna scatter it around. And then you wanna stir it in. And then you wanna let it sit for 30 minutes and let it do its work. There should be a faint smell of bleach, uh, but it'll be drinkable. And remember, just like with boiling, this doesn't remove any bad stuff from the water like chemicals. This just kills the live bad stuff. Something every home, every car, everyone should have in their purse is a life straw. It's something that's inexpensive and easy to have on hand and it gives you so many options when it comes to purifying water. First of all, you're gonna to wanna to find water. Find the cleanest water that you can. I just found here where this water is kind of trickling out of the ground a little bit. And it seems to be the cleanest and freshest water around here. So I'm gonna collect some water here. So now I've got some water as clean as it can be in this area, and then I can just pull this off, stick it in here. Actually, I gotta pull this off too. Okay, now I can stick it in here and... Hello, water. So the Life Straw is something that everyone should have. This will filter up to a thousand liters of water. Just remember though, it does not filter out chemicals or toxic spills if you're in an industrial area and there's a lot of debris in the water. Um, you may not want to use that there. Try and find the cleanest source that you can. Um, the Berkey is better suited to dealing with water like that. But the Life Straw can be life-saving at a time where you may not have access to other options. Those are some basic options, but if you have a little more money to put into this and you want a big step forward, that would be the Berkey right here or other similar options. But the general idea is it's a countertop filter. You pour water in the top container. There's, uh, we like the black filters. The Berkey black filters are the better ones and gravity forces it through the filters and it drips down into the lower container where you now have drinking water and then you can uh, use the spigot here on the front to get your drinking water, cooking water, whatever. Excellent option, filters out all kinds of stuff. Or if you want something that's portable for your bug out kit, then this is a nice option. We like these for camping. Uh, this one is made by MSR. You put the dirty water in this bag, hang it up in a tree, gravity pushes it through the tube, through the filter into this bag where you end up with clean water. And you don't even have to pump like you do with so many backpacking filters. So there you have it. The number one cardinal rule is to find the best possible water source you can. So you start with the best water from the beginning and you have to do the least to it. When there is no doctor and help's not coming anytime soon, even basic medical issues can become serious. In day seven of the 521 preparedness plan, we're not gonna waste your time with lists of what all decent first aid kits should already have. We're gonna focus on the items your kit probably doesn't have, but it should. For serious burns, my first go-to is, oddly enough, tofu. I just slice it into strips and place it directly onto the burn. I also keep lavender oil on hand for burns. Another family favorite is the B&W ointment. This is just a salve for burns and wounds, that's why it's B&W, and you just take it and smear it directly on the burn area. Also, local raw honey works wonders for burns. And last but not least is the good old aloe vera plant. Every trauma kit needs a good SWAT T tourniquet. This is the best for stopping bleeding. And then, of course, a pressure dressing is essential for keeping pressure on a wound, helping it to clot, all that sort of thing. Cayenne powder, amazingly enough, can help to stop bleeding. And if you have a really serious emergency bleed that you can't stop any other way, quick clot can be really useful for that. And for closing wounds, liquid skin. When dealing with fevers, everyone needs to have a good thermometer. In our home, we actually don't treat fevers as an enemy. 
A fever is actually your body's natural process to try and fight diseases. But if it does get to a dangerous high level, you do want to have some way to bring that temperature back down. One way that I do is actually by rubbing peppermint oil on the back. If that doesn't work, you can use cool or tepid baths. And if that doesn't work, then I use ibuprofen to help bring the temperature down. For infections, one of our favorites is tea tree oil. Hydrogen peroxide is an old standby. And then there's charcoal powder. You can do a poultice and it can do amazing things for pulling infection out. Just don't put it on an open wound. Garlic oil is awesome for uh, ear infection and great for other wounds. And salt water rinse is awesome for oral infection. When dealing with colds, there's a few things that we like to personally turn to. First of all, a good quality chest rub really helps to open up the lungs. Also, as a natural decongestant, we like to use a combination of NAC and quercetin. Also, if you're dealing with a sore throat, combining some local raw honey with a little bit of lemon juice makes a big difference. In our home, we like to use hydrotherapy. It uses contrast between the hot and the cold to help increase circulation in uh, your chest. And last, we like to have a nebulizer on hand. We mix a little bit of this food grade hydrogen peroxide with some water, diluting it down, and then we use that in our nebulizer. If you're prone to allergic reactions, you need to get a prescription from your doctor for an EpiPen and have some on hand. But beyond that, liquid Benadryl is super helpful for kids, pets, even adults for dealing with allergic reactions. And then for bites and things like this, uh, charcoal powder, a poultice on the skin, or this is a charcoal that's kind of like a lip balm that you can smear on your skin for a bite. When dealing with musculoskeletal issues, there's a number of different things you can do depending on what's hurting and where. One of my favorite things would be massage or stretching. Another thing that you can do is a contrast of hot and cold. You just place the muscle or joint into a bucket of hot water for three minutes and then change it over to the cold for 30 seconds. Repeat that three to five times ending on the cold and you'd be surprised at how much better you'll feel. Also, be sure and have a deep blue or tiger balm, something you can rub on that joint or muscle that's hurting. I like to use helichrysum. And last but not least is my favorite, comfrey. If you have the budget for a more advanced solution, you can get into a really complete first aid kit like this Amp3 Outfitter, which is our favorite. It's just super complete and has everything. The other thing I wanted to mention is if you must have any prescription drugs in order to live, you need to have a long supply of them. And if your doctor won't give you that, we have a link in the resources page, the 521 resources page, where you can get a long-term supply of many prescription drugs from a legit American company with doctors on staff. The biggest thing you can do now is to take care of yourself and get into excellent health. This means eating a whole foods diet, lots of exercise, minimizing exposure to toxins, detoxing, and drinking lots of water. During a disaster, there's often a total blackout of communications where you have no idea what's going on in the world around you or with your family or friends. And this can make the difference between life and death sometimes. So in day eight of the 521 preparedness plan, we're gonna be looking at what some options are. So you gotta figure out who you're wanting to communicate with. If all you wanna do is communicate with emergency services, then your first step is really gonna be a cell phone. Try that, see if you've got a cell phone signal. But as we all know, this often is not the case in a disaster. So another option that's really cool that is kind of an emerging option is if you have a newer cell phone, like a iPhone 14 or later, we'll be able to communicate via satellite with emergency services where you can send a SOS message to emergency services to let them know that you're in trouble and what your location is. And either now or in the future, it sounds like there's also gonna be a ability to communicate via text messages, even with friends, via satellite. Now, what about if you're wanting to communicate with friends or family that are in your local area? Well, there's an interesting option that opens up with two-way radios. 
And this is really cool because unless you're going through a repeater, it's not dependent on any infrastructure at all, which is really nice for a disaster type of scenario. And there's a lot of bands of radio out there, types of radios and all these things. I don't have time to get into it now. If you check out the resources page, we'll try and have some info there. But be thinking about creating a network of friends or family in the area where you may not be able to communicate with the furthest away friend, but if you can communicate with one friend and they can communicate with the next, you can relay messages and have kind of a network of sorts. So that's a, a really cool option. Then moving on to long distance communications. And with this, you're gonna to want to check out a really cool satellite-based internet option called Starlink. And this is an excellent addition to any emergency communications plan because it doesn't matter what's going on around you in your area, this is going to enable you to get out to the world as long as you have a way to power this thing. And so yes, uh, I do think that there are still some ways that this could be disrupted. So because of that, I don't think that this is a primary that this should be your only means of communications but I think it makes an excellent addition and uh, also it's doing double duty it's probably not costing a whole lot more than what most people are paying for internet access right now and then you just add that additional autonomy on there which is awesome in addition to Starlink there's other satellite based devices out there that can to some greater or lesser extent communicate via satellites I'm talking about bivy sticks, Garmin inReach, uh, spot devices that uh, adventurers will take with them. They may have a SOS button, so that could be used with emergency services to communicate with them. But it can also, and depending upon the device, it may be able to send text messages to friends and that sort of thing. So that's another option to think about for long distance. And then finally, we get to the ultimate long distance communications option as far as independence and that is ham radio in the HF band where you're actually bouncing off of the ionosphere and you can talk to another country even and of course this is more involved requires a radio a you know more expensive radio and training and a license and all this kind of thing but it's a great option and something to consider uh, be aware though that even with ham radio and HF, it can be disrupted by solar storms and things like that that are happening. And regardless of whatever type of communications you go with, if it involves anything, any device that's electrical, don't forget about power. How are you going to power that? And we'll be talking about power in a upcoming day of the 521 preparedness plan. Communication is not optional, especially during a disaster. So what I need you to do right now is to determine who it is that you need to communicate with and then take the options that we discussed in this video and find at least one of them that would work for you and start working on that one and get it in place so that you have a plan that works so that you can communicate. When emergencies hit, having control over your finances can be the lifeline your family needs. Whether it's a job loss, health emergency, or a natural disaster, having your money in order can make all the difference. And it also helps you be able to afford your preparedness goals. So step one is creating a budget. A budget is just a plan for your money so you can see exactly where it's going. And when you know where your money goes, you can make better choices. First, write down your total monthly income. That's your starting point. Now list all of your expenses like rent, mortgage, utilities, groceries, anything else you spend money on. You can keep it as simple as a pen and paper or you can use a free budgeting app, whatever works for you. But the goal is simple, spend less than you make. And if you find your expenses are more than your income, that's where the magic happens. Look for areas to cut back. It could be something simple like eating out or canceling an unnecessary subscription. We have three different categories, monthly expenses, annual expenses, and savings. Don't forget about those annual recurring expenses. We'll look at how to handle those in just a moment. This is about living within your means, being in control of your money instead of letting your money control you. And it's the first step toward financial preparedness. 
Once your budget is set, it's time to create an emergency fund. This is your safety net for when life throws unexpected expenses at you, like car repairs, medical bills, or even a job loss. Start small if you need to. You can set an initial goal of $500 or $1,000 and build up a little at a time, even if it's just $5 a week. Every small contribution adds up over time. The key here is to be consistent and treat this as if it's untouchable for when a real emergency comes up. The peace of mind that you're going to gain from knowing you've got a cushion will make all the difference. As you start to see that fund grow, you can build it up to three to six months of living expenses. This takes time, but every step you take gets you closer to being ready for the unexpected. Another type of emergency fund is your pantry. I mean, think about it. The more food you have stocked up in your pantry, the longer you can go in a crisis. On day two, we showed you how you could bulk up your pantry with just $50. The more you add to your rotating pantry, the more of a runway you'll have when you lose a job or an unexpected emergency arises, or you just can't make ends meet for a month. This strategy has saved us before when our income dropped lower than our expenses for one month. We cut the grocery budget dramatically to stretch the rest of the finances to cover what needed to be covered. And we ate from our, from our pantry for that month and replenished it at a later month when our income was a little bit more favorable. Next, we need to talk about sinking funds. These are savings for expenses you know are coming, like for instance, property taxes, annual insurance payments, or Christmas. Instead of being unprepared for these bills when they come in, you can plan for them by setting aside a little bit each month. So let's say that you're gonna need $600 for your annual insurance this year. Set aside $50 a month in a sinking fund, and when the bill arrives, you're ready. It's a way of breaking big expenses into small, manageable chunks. And you don't need to do this with cash. We have set up separate savings category at our bank, and we just transfer the money each month into our sinking funds. Then we track it with our budgeting app. This way, there's no stress when the bills arrive. You're already prepared. Our favorite budgeting app is Every Dollar. You can track all of your expenses and your income, your sinking funds, and watch your emergency funds slowly grow. I've used both the free version and the paid version for years, and it's been a game changer for us. We're in control of our money instead of it being in control of us. And using those sinking funds makes it easy to stay in control of your money all year long. You'll never have to panic when those big expenses pop up. They're already covered. So that's it. Three simple steps to start managing your finances and be prepared for any emergency. Make a budget build your emergency fund, and set up sinking funds to handle life's unknown expenses. None of this is complicated, but it does take consistency. And the best time to start is right now. So get a notepad and start writing down those expenses now, and set aside a few dollars in an emergency fund today. Ever stop to think what would happen if your most important documents went up in flames or were wiped out in a disaster? In today's world, if you can't get your hands on these critical papers or files, you could lose access to everything from your money to your property. Even something as simple as breaking your laptop could be devastating if you're not prepared. So let's talk about the documents you must protect, where to keep them, and how to make sure they'll never get lost. Everyone's needs are different, but here's some examples of documents that you might want to back up. For instance, personal documents like that, you know, that prove who you are, like passports, birth certificates, social security cards, these kinds of things. Legal and property documents like wills, powers of attorney, deeds, um, titles, any of these kinds of things. Medical records like uh, insurance cards, prescriptions, paper prescriptions would be preferable and advanced directives, things like that. Financial records, like bank account, investment account, uh, retirement account stuff, more recent tax returns, anything along those lines. Insurance records, which are really important during disasters especially. And business records, if you own a business, you know, like business licenses, or if you're an employee, uh, any employment records that you might have. Sentimental things like photos, videos, uh, letters that are irreplaceable, any of these kinds of things, and also passwords, however you store your passwords, whether it's on paper, in a password manager, or encrypted file, something like that, you need to have 
a backup way if you forget the password or if something happens to you and your heirs need to be able to get into these things, you need to have those kinds of things in there. So right now just think about which of these that you might want to or that you might need to have uh, stored safely or have protected in some way. You need both paper and digital copies because let's face it, no system is foolproof. Paper copies are a lifesaver if your computer crashes or hackers take out online systems. Digital copies protect you if your paper ones get burned, flooded, or lost. You want a safe that can hold up under heat and the fire rating is really important. I recommend at least a 60 minute fire rating and that means that it can withstand the heat of a fire for up to 60 minutes. So here you've got a couple of different options. This is a inexpensive uh, portable small safe that is better than nothing but it is only a 30 minute safe, only 30 minutes of fire protection it says on the tag and it's very easy for a thief to just pick it up and, and run with it or to pry it open or whatever so not a very good option by itself but better than nothing. If you can a more substantial safe is better and it doesn't have to be one of these great big huge rifle safes it can be something more sized like this and this is a good sturdy safe that is a 60 minute safe and um, it's really sturdy heavy duty and has plenty of space for documents and stuff and what i really like to do is to take a little safe like this and put the most sensitive documents inside of here and then stick this inside the bigger safe and then you've got double protection Another option is to keep a backup of the most critical papers with someone you trust. For instance, you might want the executor of your will to have a copy of it. Then if something happens to your home, there's still a hard copy somewhere. Scanning with your phone is quick and easy, or you can use a regular scanner. And apps like Apple Notes can use your phone's built-in camera as a scanner. You can store them securely in free cloud options like Google Drive or Apple iCloud. Just know that their space is limited unless you pay for more storage. And if you want more room or security, you can use a file storage option like Dropbox that automatically backs up everything or portions of your phone or your computer to the cloud automatically. Even some password managers will have a limited amount of space that you can use for storage of documents. So there you have it. The key to document safety is redundancy, paper, digital, and off-site storage. It's not just about convenience, it's about survival. The right papers in the right place could mean the difference between chaos and calm when disaster hits. It's essential for fueling your car so you can get help or bug out of an unsafe disaster zone. It's critical for generators and countless other important tools. Fuel is an essential part of any preparedness plan, but all too often, fuel is the weak link that fails during an emergency. Fuel can go bad in as little as a few months, but it doesn't have to. We've personally stored hundreds of gallons of gasoline for as long as six or seven years with excellent results. And we're gonna show you our six principles of long-term storage so your fuel doesn't fail when you need it the most. To start with, you wanna make sure that your tanks are topped off as much as possible, not overfilled, but topped off because the more air space there is in there, the more potential for condensation, and that means water in your fuel, and that is not good. But also storing in a location that is covered and dry, uh, where there's the least amount of potential for water to get in there. Water gets absorbed by ethanol in the fuel, and that creates all kinds of issues. When you go to the gas station to get your fuel, do yourself a big favor and get non-ethanol gas. It'll save you so many heartaches and so many problems. And if you're having trouble finding non-ethanol, there's a website in the description that may provide some guidance on gas stations in your area where you can find it. Uh, fuel containers. Most of you are probably gonna be using fuel, five gallon fuel containers just because they're easy to use. These are my favorite by far, the no spill containers. But if you're storing a larger amount of fuel, then you might want to go with a metal 55 gallon drum that's made for oil or gas. Heat speeds up fuel degradation. So if you live in a hot climate, there's not much you can do about it. So don't worry too much. But anything you can do to keep it cooler will help extend the life of the fuel. For instance, keeping it in an open air shady spot instead of the direct sun. 
Okay, it's time to talk about carbs. You know, we don't get enough protein in our diet. Wait a minute, you're talking about carburetors? Oh, that's right. Okay, so um, if you have a non-fuel injected small engine, the gas in there is gonna go bad so fast. If there's a fuel cutoff switch, cut the fuel off and then run it until the engine dies and you've just burned the fuel out of the carb. But if there's not a cutoff switch, then I'm just gonna dump the gas out of the tank. I'm gonna start it up, run it until it dies. Another thing you wanna do is add a good fuel stabilizer to any fuel that you're wanting to store. It's super important. And this is the best stuff that I know of, PRIG for gasoline. They also make PRID for diesel. It's industrial grade stuff and we have used it personally for like 25 years or more. And uh, they claim that if you treat the fuel once a year with this stuff, that it will keep indefinitely. Now, I know from personal experience that we have stored fuel for up to six or seven years with PRIG and it ran in the car fine. It did great and that was in hot, humid conditions. So. I'm really sold on this stuff. And it's super concentrated. Uh, one ounce treats 16 gallons. So if you're treating a five gallon container like this, it's gonna be a little over a quarter of an ounce. And so it's really easy to measure out here, that sort of thing. And then you dump it in, and then you wanna mix it in. This would be ideal to do while you're filling the container up. So you dump it in first and then add your gas. But if you do it after the fact, there are ways to agitate it. Obviously with a five gallon container like this, you can agitate it like this. But even in a bigger container, you could use a hose and blow some compressed air in or something like that to agitate it and stir it up. Just remember, your fuel stash won't last forever. If an emergency lasts long enough, you'll need to either buy more fuel or be able to take care of your necessities without it. But in the aftermath of a disaster, there's no replacement for it. And fuel-powered tools and vehicles can make impossible things happen. So let's get started with this important step and put up a reasonable amount of fuel and do the best you can to implement as many of these fuel storage principles as you can. When it comes to preparedness, one of the most important things you can do is to understand your why. Why are you making these preparations? This really is foundational since your why will impact most, if not all of your nuts and bolts decisions. In day 12 of the 521 preparedness plan, we're gonna share part of our why with you. We try to ground all of our important decisions in our faith since that's who we are. So here are some Bible verses that have played an important role in shaping how we prepare and why. Hmm. If I had to pick a theme verse, it would be Proverbs 21, 31. It says, the horse is prepared against the day of battle, but safety is of the Lord. And this is illustrating the principle of human effort combined with divine power. You know, that makes me think of the chapter in James that says, what does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but does not have works? Can faith save him? Thus also faith by itself if it does not have works, is dead. Hmm. You know, that principle is something that a lot of folks recognize on a practical level. For instance, you can't just sit around if you're going to support your family. You have a part to play. That's right. It makes me think of Paul saying, For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. <laughs> <laughs> I use that one on the kids sometimes. <laughs> And this principle applies to providing for your family's basic necessities also. It makes me think of that verse in Proverbs that says, Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise, which, having no captain, overseer, or ruler, provides her supplies in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. You know, the ant puts away food in a time of plenty, the summertime, to get her through that time of scarcity, the wintertime. And this principle isn't just about food, it's also about the other basic necessities of life. For instance, in the book of Lamentations, you mention a verse there where it talks about the other basic necessities. Yeah, it says, Remember, O Lord, what has come upon us. Consider and behold our reproach. 
Our inheritance is turned to strangers, our houses to aliens, we are orphans and fatherless, our mothers are as widows. So you can see he's painting this really grim picture of this catastrophe that has fallen upon his people. But listen to what comes next. He says, We have drunken our water for money. Our wood is sold unto us. We have given the hand to the Egyptians and to the Assyrians to be satisfied with bread. And friends, it wasn't just the fact that they were having to spend more money that bothered him. It was the fact that they were now dependent on their enemies for basic necessities of life. But I wonder how many of us are drinking our water for money, either by buying it from the water authority or by buying power from the power company in order to pump it out of the ground. How many of us is our wood sold unto us, our ability to heat our homes and cook our food? And how many of us are putting out our hand to the Egyptians and the Assyrians to be satisfied with bread? Yeah, you know, friends, we have a responsibility to our family to provide for their basic necessities. And I believe this is one of the things that Paul was referring to in this stern warning to Timothy. 1 Timothy 5, 8 says, But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Wow, that's strong. But, you know, just think about it. There's coming a time when just bringing a paycheck home is not going to be providing for your family because you may not always be able to buy these basic necessities with money. So now is the time for us to prepare in a time of relative peace so that you're able to provide for your family's basic needs when all these conveniences that we've become so dependent upon are disrupted. And I'll leave you with the example of one of my heroes, Noah. Jesus said that Noah was a type of, of the end times. He said, as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And so listen to this in the faith chapter of all places, Hebrews 11, Noah is presented as an example for all of us. It says, by faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet. Have we been warned of God of things not seen as yet? Yeah, we have. Revelation. Yeah. So what did he do? It says, he moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. So right now is the time for us to put our faith into action as Noah did. Let's do our part, provide for our family, both now and in hard times. And if this feels impossible to you right now, I want to encourage you to just focus on your next step, whatever that might be. And as you're doing that, the way will open for you to do the things that seem impossible to you now. Every human should be able to start a fire under a variety of conditions, including rainy weather like what we've been dealing with today. Well, in the next five minutes, you're going to learn how. To start with, you're going to need a way to start your fire, to actually make fire. And there's a bunch of different options out there. I mean, something as simple as matches. Trouble is that they only, you only have so many of them, and if they get wet, they're no good. You can use a lighter, but trouble with these is they run out of fuel and yeah, they're kind of big and bulky. So I really, really highly recommend some kind of a ferro stick, like any of these here, that make sparks, big shower of sparks, especially the bigger ones. They can make a, a really significant shower of sparks. And this is a little pocket one that you can carry with you anywhere, which is really cool. We like these too, so that you've always got it on you. So you can make sparks, but how do you turn that into fire? Well. This is the best way. It's as simple as stuff that you've already got in your home. Cotton ball, cotton balls and uh, Vaseline or petroleum jelly. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this, we're gonna soak this cotton ball with Vaseline. Okay, so I think I've gotten it pretty saturated now. And our next step is we're gonna squeeze out the excess because if you leave all that excess in there, it's not going to catch a spark. Okay, I think I've gotten it pretty squeezed out. When I squeeze on it now, I'm not getting much. And so, and it feels noticeably drier. So we're gonna call that good. When you're ready to use your cotton balls, you're gonna pull it out 
and I like to pull just a piece of it off, just a chunk of it off. You don't need the whole cotton ball usually unless it's just soaking wet everything and you gotta dry it out. But even still, I like to start with a smaller piece and then you're gonna tear it apart because you wanna expose those fibers, those cotton fibers, so that the sparks can get in there. And then watch what happens when we throw some sparks on it. Boom, one, one throw of sparks and off she goes. And this stuff, it burns a long time. And I'd say it's been burning for about a minute, probably. So that's a good amount of time to get a fire going. Birch bark is one of the best things for getting a fire going. Just kind of peel it off. Some birch trees, you can get good slabs of it, like big slabs and everything. But just get what you can. Some of it is really fine paper like this, but this is gonna be excellent fire starter, especially when it's wet outside. I want you to bear in mind that this birch bark is super wet. The tree was really wet and that I got it from because we've gotten a lot of rain. But once it takes off, once it gets lit, um, it'll just burn and burn for a good while. Look at that stuff burn. If you can get a little flame going, one of the best things to get wet wood to light is pitch, pine pitch. There we go, look at that. Oh man, that is gonna make an amazing fire there. We once did a little experiment and it went for about um, 15 minutes. If you can just get a flame going, then it, and get it going long enough to start the pitch on fire, then you've got an amazing fire source. Okay, I think it's been going almost five minutes now and there's still a ways to go. A lot of fuel left here. You may not always have your cotton balls with you, so it's good to have some other materials that you can pick from. And so this is one type of material that we have here in the Northwest at least. We call it old man's beard. I don't know what the technical name for it is, but it's moss that grows on trees and it can be useful if it's not too wet. You want to kind of fluff it up, pull it apart a little bit. There we go. Okay, now you want to have your sticks ready. You don't want to blow too hard. Yeah, get that, um, that pitch going. And that'll be, that'll get anything to light almost. And we've got ourselves a nice fire going now. Starting fires is a skill that takes some practice, so I suggest that you try your hand at it in a safe environment where you aren't going to set the woods on fire. And it's going to be a skill that'll serve you really, really well. Emergencies usually happen when least expected. What you have on your person may be all that you have to work with. So it only makes sense to handpick the items you'd want to have on you when things go sideways. Everyone's needs are different, so only you can come up with your ideal everyday carry setup. But here are some types of things you might want to consider. At the end of the day, there's only so much stuff that you can have on your person, so you're going to have to make some compromises. But here's what I often have as my everyday carry. Start with a good knife. Flashlight is indispensable. Once you start carrying one, you'll wonder how you lived without it. And you've got things like keys that you just need, you know your billfold, <laughs> cards, and stuff like that. Uh, I like to always have cash on me. A fire starter is a great thing to have where you can actually um, get a fire going. And this one has magnesium that you can scrape off and start a fire with that. And let's see, what else do we have here? My belt, this. I like to have a good sturdy belt, and this one is actually made where in an emergency you could repel with it. And then think about in the winter time, for instance, your, your heavy jacket often has big pockets, and so there's additional space there that you might not have other times of the year. Take advantage of it. For instance, maybe you don't have space in your pockets for some fire starter, but you do in the winter time with these big pockets. Also, I put this jacket on this morning and I had a tourniquet in there because I had the space and so I've I've just keep it in there all kinds of things like this okay ladies let's talk about everyday carry 
First of all, it's a little bit more of a challenge because we like to dress fashionable. So let me start with the shoes. So first of all, with the shoes, most of them we wear aren't the most practical shoes. So always try and keep within reach somewhere a good pair of walking shoes, or if it's winter time, I like to throw my muck boots in the back of the car no matter where I go. Warm clothes. So when you're dressing fashionable, try thinking about layering underneath your clothes. It's healthier for you anyway, and it gives you more options if you find yourself stranded or only with what you have on. Next is what we can fit in our pockets. You have to think compact, you have to think small, but there are a lot of options. All right, first I have a flashlight. You need to have something small that you're comfortable carrying. Also, a compact pocket knife. I always like to have extra hair ties on me. You'd be surprised what you can use a hair tie for. Um, I like to carry my essential oils with me on, on, with me all the time because sometimes you just need it. All right, next, of course, I have my keys. And ladies, a ferro stick. It takes no space at all. Okay, another thing I want to mention. If you carry a purse and you're diligent about carrying one, then you have a lot more options. Unfortunately, I leave mine sitting everywhere, so I don't carry my purse. So I have a wallet that I carry and I always keep a little bit of cash in my wallet everywhere I go. Okay, last I have my phone and in my warm winter coat, I always keep a little earmuffs or a headband because I don't know about you, but that makes a big difference for me. And a warm pair of gloves. Another thing you wanna consider is if you like wearing dresses or especially if you're going, to, going somewhere where you wanna dress up, there are shorts that you can wear under your dresses that have pockets in them. I have a pair. And whenever I wear a skirt or I dress up in a dress, I always wear those shorts. I always wear those shorts underneath because then I can put quite a number of these items in my shorts with me wherever I go. And last, just a quick word about protection. Especially as women, we need to be conscious and very intentional about um, thinking about ways that we can be, that we can protect not just ourselves, but also our children if we're out and about with little ones. So find something that you're comfortable with, that you, you have training for, and that you can use to protect yourself and your family. So when you get up each morning, I want you to think about what you're putting on your person and be intentional about adding items that would be helpful to you if you were to get stuck somewhere with just what you had on. Picture this, a bad storm hits and the power goes out. Now you're stuck wondering how to cook dinner. It's a reality so many have faced and one that you can be ready for. Today in the 521 Preparedness Plan, we'll explore simple off-grid cooking solutions that work. So when the power goes out, you'll know exactly what to do. Dutch ovens are another really excellent tool for cooking and baking off the grid. There's a number of different ways you can use them. Here we're using an open campfire with coals, but you could also use charcoal briquettes or even a grill for a more even temperature. Here we have stew cooking over the fire. We also have a bread that's baking, and then we did some cinnamon rolls. all with the coals just from our fire here. So the cinnamon rolls are done and I'm gonna put on the frosting. This is another off-grid cooking option. 
It's a sun oven and the reflectors reflect the sun into the glassed in area here and the temperature goes up on the thermometer. Obviously you got to have some direct sun. This is not a sunny day and so the temperature isn't getting very high. But if you're in a location where you get a good bit of sun then this could be a decent option for you. And uh, the one thing I would say is this isn't a cheap option. It is going to cost a little bit. If you have a wood stove, check and see if you can cook on it like I'm doing here. This is our summertime canning stove. When it's too hot to can inside, we'll set this up outside and you can can a whole bunch of stuff on one tank of propane. And so this could also make a great emergency stove for cooking. Or you could use your camp stove. Or if you have a grill of some sort, a propane or a charcoal grill, you can use that as long as you've stashed up on briquettes or charcoal chunks or propane. So try these methods before you need them. Pick which methods might work for your situation and then practice them. Try cooking with a campfire or using a Dutch oven so you know how they work. You might be surprised at how easy and fun it can be. Try making breakfast on a camp stove or baking bread in a Dutch oven. The more you practice now, the easier it will be when you really need it. And don't forget to keep extra fuel and supplies on hand. Stock up on your propane, charcoal, and firewood. It's better to have it and not need it than the other way around. It's where we go when things go wrong. Home should be a safe place. And with a little preparation, it can be. In the next five minutes, you'll learn simple steps you can take right now to make yours as safe and secure as possible when threatened by storms, intruders, or even fire. I grew up in tornado country, and I still remember all those nights where the sirens would be going off for tornadoes. And we'd run downstairs to the one room in the house that didn't have windows. And that's where we'd stay while the storm passed. And that was the downstairs bathroom. And that is conventional wisdom for storms of this type that you want to be preferably in an interior room that has no windows. A basement would be even more ideal if you have one, as long as there's not um, as something super heavy up above you. You can also cover up with blankets or mattresses or that sort of thing. And in our house, the one room that has no windows is here in our closet in the sauna. And so you can look around your house and find where there would be any rooms that would be the most secure for you to hang out when storms pass over. In the event of an earthquake, you're going to want to identify something that has structural integrity in your home. Something like this table. It's sturdy and it's strong and it's heavy. So this would be a great option. But if you have something else in your home that provides that strength overhead, that's what you're going to want to identify and move to that space. Uh, it's not generally recommended to run outside during an earthquake, but if you happen to find yourself outside during an earthquake, then try and find an open clearing or an area that's away from buildings or trees. If you're dealing with a wildfire, uh, unless you have experience and you're set up to shelter in place, probably the best option would be to just evacuate from that area. Also, same with flooding. If your home is in a danger zone and you have the potential for severe flooding in your area, then probably making an evacuation plan would be your best option. There's a lot that you can do to make your home safer from a home invasion. One thing is your door. You would be amazed how easy it is for somebody to kick your door in. And this is because screws that are sent with that striker plates for deadbolts and doorknobs are often short and they don't go very far into studs, if at all. And so you can pull those short screws out and use a screw gun to run in some longer screws like a three inch or even longer if it takes that to get into the stud. Run that in on your striker plates and also at least one or two on each hinge and you'll make your door so much harder to kick in. Also, there are devices that you can install on the bottom of your door that will make it extremely difficult for somebody to kick it in, such as the night lock. And that can be a good option too. In case of a home invasion, you'll want to pick a room to retreat to. And it'd be ideal if the door to that room is a reinforced solid core door with a lock, perhaps even a deadbolt if you're in a volatile area. You'll want to make sure you have a phone handy in there for calling for help 
And it would also be wise to have defensive tools safely stored nearby. Now this is a highly personal topic and only you can decide what your best option is, but whichever route you go, you need to train with it and be comfortable using it. For home safety from fire, I'm sure you already have a smoke alarm. Just make sure that you test it once a month and change the battery once a year, unless it's a permanent 10 year battery. For fire extinguishers, you need at least a couple of fire extinguishers, one in your kitchen, one on each floor of the house, one in the garage if you have one. Type ABC is a good all-purpose type of fire extinguisher. Type K can go in the kitchen. And I like a 10-pound fire extinguisher, but if you find that to be too heavy for you, a five-pounder can work. For chimney fire, Chimfex sticks are amazing. You can put out a chimney fire in as little as 22 seconds. And finally, you wanna have a good evacuation plan where everybody, every bedroom has two ways out, a door and a window, and then everyone needs to be aware of a rendezvous point where everybody goes to that same spot so that everyone can be accounted for and you don't think that someone is still in the house when they're actually safe. Keeping your home safe doesn't have to be complicated. It just takes a little preparation. Start by identifying a safe room, checking your fire extinguishers and smoke alarms, considering defense options, and setting up an evacuation plan with the rendezvous point. When disaster hits, there's a hidden killer most people miss. Poor hygiene and contaminated water can turn a simple emergency into a full-scale health crisis. But with a few simple steps, you can protect your family from this silent threat. In the next five minutes, we'll show you some simple strategies that can give you peace of mind. The first thing we're gonna look at is personal hygiene options. My favorite thing to use is baby wipes. Um, and so we have a stash of baby, baby wipes on hand. Also, you'll wanna have some hand sanitizer. These are great options, especially if water is scarce. The next thing you want to consider is make sure that you have bars of soap and some extra dish soap on hand. Nothing worse than running out of dish soap or bars of soap in the bathroom. Also, something that's often overlooked is toothbrushes and an extra stash of toothpaste. Um, having extra toothpaste on hand um, can really make a big difference in an emergency. And if you don't already have a stash of TP on hand, make sure that you get a stash. And last, uh, ladies, uh, make sure that you have a stash of personal hygiene products, whatever it is that you're comfortable using. For me personally, I like to use a silicone cup because um, then I don't have to stockpile products and I don't have the extra waste. And it's a very sanitary option. It's important for everyone to keep their hands clean, especially in a disaster. And this makes a great makeshift hand washing station, but you can use any kind of a bucket or container that has a spigot in the bottom, use it to wash your hands. And if you are limited on your drinking water, then you can use other less savory water for this. And you could sanitize it with bleach. We talk about that in day six of the 521 preparedness plan, the dilutions for using bleach to um, sanitize um, drinking water. And speaking of bleach, you can also use it for disinfecting surfaces. And it's a stronger mixture though, and it would be somewhere around one third cup of bleach to one gallon of water, and you can use that to disinfect any surfaces or whatever you already use. If your sewer system is working, then by all means, take the lid off the tank of your toilet, Fill it up with any water you can get your hands on, even if it's dirty water, and you've got a fully functional toilet. But if your sewer system isn't working, you're gonna have to look somewhere else. And this is one cheap option, quick and easy, five or six gallon bucket, and no, there's not barley flakes in here anymore. This is a repurposed bucket. And you can put a lid. This is actually a toilet seat lid that's quite comfortable. It was inexpensive. You can line the bucket with a trash bag and it works quite well after each use. Pour a little lime on top to keep the smell under control. And when it gets more full, you can find some woods that aren't too far away, dig a big hole and bury this. This is our camp solar shower and it's really nice. You fill it with water and then lay it on the ground with the clear side facing up and it will, the sun will warm this water up really nice and quick. And then you just hang it up as high as you can above you. 
and turn this little nozzle and look at that, nice shower. If you can stay clean, manage your waste and keep pure water on hand, everything's gonna start looking up and everyone's gonna be healthier too. So let's start small, it doesn't take much. Just stock up on TP, soap and baby wipes, get a five gallon bucket and a seat and perhaps a solar shower and you'll be miles ahead when the bathroom calls. Electricity is not a basic necessity, but we've become so dependent upon it for our basic necessities that it might as well be. And in day 18 of the 521 preparedness plan, you'll get cheap and easy options for powering small devices, as well as some more substantial options for larger needs when the power grid is down. The first thing you're gonna to need to do is to identify any battery powered devices that you're going to want to have during a disaster or an emergency. For example, flashlights, your cell phone to communicate, or maybe some two-way radios. Also look around the room and identify any corded devices you might need. For example, your refrigerator, maybe an oxygen concentrator, or your Starlink. Once you've identified the kinds of devices that need to be powered, now you need to start making a game plan. Step one is make sure that you have whatever batteries that you need to power things like your flashlights, your two-way radios, or any other devices that you want. Also, another option is small battery packs are great for recharging things like your phone. You can just plug it in like that, and bingo, you've got a phone charging. Also, there's some really neat options with solar lanterns. This is one that we have, and you can plug your cell phone in right here and charge your phone just using the sun to recharge the battery and the light. There are also hand crank versions where you can generate some more power by cranking it with your hand. If you have larger power needs, many folks think that a portable solar generator is the answer to all their problems, and it could be, but I wanna go run through a little math with you. Let's say that you are wanting to power a refrigerator and that refrigerator is using one and a half kilowatt hours per day. <clears throat> so let's say that you get a portable solar generator that says it's a two kilowatt hour unit and has 400 watts of solar like this Jackery. So on a perfect day, that those 400 watts of solar would produce maybe somewhere in the neighborhood of 300 watts when it's perfectly sunny in the middle of the day for a couple of hours. And then during the hours before and after in the morning and evening, it'll produce even less than that. So maybe when it's sunny, you might possibly get to the one and a half hour, a kilowatt hours of power usage that that fridge consumes, but that's assuming that it's perfectly sunny every single day. What happens when it's cloudy for a day or two or three? So as you can see, it takes a sizable battery bank and solar array to reliably power sizable loads like this. And so therefore, I highly recommend that you start with a fuel powered generator as your first step if you have anything more than just tiny loads. Here we are out in the generator shed. As you can tell, I like Honda, always have, probably always will, but there's other good makes out there. One thing I will say is with Honda in particular, you'll often see at the big box stores, they'll have a Honda generator, quote unquote. It really only has a Honda engine. Everything else is some other no name. And those are not necessarily the same level of quality, but um, Yamaha, is good, uh, Generac has some good stuff, some not so good stuff, just depends. When you're deciding what size you need, what I would say is figure out what is the largest item that you need to power. And if the largest item you need to power doesn't use a whole lot of power at one time, then go with a smaller generator. For instance, if all you need to power is a refrigerator, they don't use a lot of power at one time. They might use three, 400 watts, plus or minus at one time. And so you could do just fine with a 1000 watt generator. So something like that, go with the Honda EU 1000 and it'll run for hours and hours on just a gallon of gas. And um, whereas a larger generator like this is not going to run nearly as long on a gallon of gas. Uh, but if you are needing to run something big, like for instance, a well pump, that's a really common item that folks are wanting to power with their generator. Well pump is gonna require in most cases, a, a sizable generator 
bigger than a 1000 and usually bigger than a 2000 watt generator. Here's a chart from Franklin Pumps that gives rec their recommendations on what size of generator you might need for different sizes of pumps. But one thing I will say is with a larger generator, you might consider going with propane as your fuel source because delivery is already taken care of. If you have a big tank there and you're already using propane, that's gonna be super simple. And also propane never goes bad. For powering your entire home off-grid like we do with a renewable solar system, it will take a substantial system. And while the cost may not be as high as you think, it's still beyond the scope of this 521 series. On day 21, we'll be pointing you to some resources for further learning about things like this. We talk a lot about preparing for short-term crises, storms, power outage, economic collapses. While these threats are real, there's something even bigger that drives us to prepare, and it's the warning found in Revelation chapter 13. It says, He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one might buy or sell except he who has the mark. Here at the close of time, the Bible tells us that Satan is going to attempt to control people through what? Their basic needs, through hmm. buying and selling. You know, when you read Revelation 13, you'll see that this beast, which is an enemy of God, works signs and wonders to try and compel and persuade people to worship him. But unlike God, who only accepts worship freely given, the enemy uses force and fear. This control goes so far as to restrict who can buy or sell. And if we're dependent on the system for our food, our water, and even our heat, we're at risk of being coerced into actions against our beliefs. Hmm. But in Revelation 14, we see another group, those who stand with God's name on their foreheads, representing a willingness to commit to Him. And while God appeals to our minds and hearts, the enemy forces a mark on either the hand or the forehead. And it doesn't matter to him if people act out of fear or out of genuine belief. His goal is control. It's like we can almost hear the enemy saying, for fear of wanting food and water and the necessities of life, people are going to turn from God and join with the world. And this is the reason why we prepare beyond just the short term. You know, when we're dependent on others for our most basic needs, we hand them control of our lives. This is why we focus on sustainable preparedness, a lifestyle that lets us live independently from the system. It's not just about surviving a storm, it's about standing ready to stay true to God, even if access to basics is cut off. Some Christians believe that we aren't going to face a great tribulation. But Revelation 7.14 describes God's people as those who come out of the great tribulation. Nowhere does the Bible teach that believers are going to escape trials through a secret rapture. On the contrary, God calls us to be faithful through tribulation, just as he did with Noah, Joseph, Nehemiah, and King Asa. <laughs> you know, when God warned Noah about the flood, Noah built an ark. When God revealed the coming famine to Joseph, he stored grain. In a time of peace, King Asa prepared for war. Over and over, the Bible shows us that God expects us to act. He calls us to prepare with what we have. God saved these people miraculously, but only after they did their part. Faith and action go hand in hand. Hmm. So when we look at prophecy, this isn't about fear. It's about faith in action. Sustainable preparedness means living independently, not relying on a system that could one day demand more than we can give. Jesus tells us in Matthew 24 that the last days will be like the days of Noah. Just as Noah prepared and trusted God, so must we. So friends, a storm is coming. The question is, are you ready? So let's take steps today to stand firm tomorrow, providing for our families and remaining faithful to God. I'll never forget that Halloween night. My family and I were tuning into a shortwave radio broadcast. 
And that night, the tone was different. It was tense and urgent. And they reported that riots were breaking out and banks had shut down and folks couldn't even get cash out of ATMs. We could hear glass breaking in the background and then, just like that, the signal went dead. We sat there in disbelief, staring at each other, feeling that gut-wrenching realization it was too late. We had no cash on hand, no evacuation plan, and honestly, we had no clue where we'd go, even if we could get out. In that moment, we felt so trapped and helpless. And even though it turned out to be a simulated broadcast, it was a wake-up call that shook us to our core. We realized just how serious this was, and we committed to getting prepared and getting out of that city. Today, we're here to make sure you don't end up feeling that same sinking feeling when a real crisis hits. A bug out bag is not just a backpack. It really is your lifeline when you're in a crisis and in a hurry. So I'm going to go ahead and prepack our go bag. So the first thing I'm going to want to make sure I have is plenty of water, a lot of water bottles. Make sure you have a water filter and I'm going to throw in a container of bleach. So I've got a number of food items. You want granola bars, high calorie items, quick, easy on the go. Also make sure you throw in a camp stove and a pot to cook in, ferro stick and some tinder and the fuel. I'm gonna throw in a sleeping bag here, also a wool blanket. Throw in some hand warmers, some warm socks, some warm layers of clothes for each person in the family and Here's my rain jacket. So I'm gonna grab toothbrushes and toothpaste, my contact stuff, some soap and hand sanitizer. Also, some personal hygiene products. And please, don't forget the TP. I also have a small tent that I'm gonna throw in just to give us some options. You're gonna to wanna to think about your power needs. Get some batteries any small power packs that you might have. And I'm gonna throw in this solar lantern because I can also charge my phone with it. And last, consider any personal items you might need for your pets, for your kids, or for yourself, and pack those too. So in addition to the camping items and clothing and boots and stuff like that, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you have a good first aid kit and any prescription medications or anything like that that you need that's unique for you. And you're also gonna to wanna to have communications, means of communications, whether that's two-way radios, whether it's phone, um, shortwave radio, AM, FM radio, ham radio, CB, whatever you use for communicating or need to use. Tools, anything that would be useful in repairing your car or making repairs anywhere. Toe strap, if you get stuck, that kind of thing. And don't forget flashlights and um, important documents that you need to have with you. Be sure and stick those in. And, you know, we could go on and on. At the end of the day, you want to customize this for specifically what you need because each person and each family is different. In an emergency, you can't rely on just one way out. Roads might be blocked or cell towers down. You need at least two or three alternate routes out of your area. If you're in a rural or mountainous area, identify those lesser known paths. Don't rely on GPS alone. Have a printed map and make sure everyone in the family knows how to read it. Next. Think about where you'll go. Is there a friend or a family member you could stay with or a safe area? Designate a meeting point in case you get separated. Knowing multiple ways out and where to go can give you peace of mind, especially when you're in the middle of a crisis. A plan isn't real until you've practiced it. In a crisis, adrenaline is high and mistakes happen easily. So take some time to do a practice run, and here's how. After you've got together your go bag, then set a timer and see how fast you can get everything loaded and be ready to go. And the more you practice now, the smoother it's gonna go in a real emergency. Getting your bug out bag ready, mapping out where you're gonna go, and actually practicing these steps could be the difference between chaos and calm when things go south. This isn't just a box to check. This is about being prepared to protect the people that you love no matter what comes. So don't wait. 
Get your bag packed, run through your route, make sure everyone in your family knows the plan. And when the moment comes, you'll be ready. Welcome everyone. If you've been following this 521 preparedness plan, you've already taken huge strides in preparing for emergencies. We've covered everything from storing water and stocking up your pantry, to creating a car survival kit, and even setting up off-grid cooking methods. By now, you're better prepared for the short-term disruptions that could come your way, and I hope you feel that peace of mind. But here's the thing. The preparations we've discussed so far are just the beginning. They'll cover you in a crisis for a few days or a few weeks maybe, but what if the problem goes on longer? And what if we need more than just a pantry of food and a few extra blankets? So let's dive deeper into what we call sustainable preparedness, because we believe real preparedness isn't just about surviving a short-term crisis. It's a lifestyle. It's about being able to live independently without being shackled to the system. COVID and recent global events have shown us just how fragile our infrastructure is. From store shelves emptied within hours, to supply chains stretched to the breaking point, we've had a taste of what life is like when things don't go as planned. But it's more than just shortages. Our entire way of life, our access to food, fuel, water, and even money is all part of a delicate web. Let's talk about oil and fuel, the very lifeline of our civilization. Did you know that the U.S. Strategic Oil Reserve, the backup plan for emergencies, has been drawn down to historic low levels? If something interrupted the flow of oil, we'd have less than 20 days before the system starts to collapse. And without fuel, our transportation comes to a halt. Our food, which often travels 1,500 miles to reach the grocery store, wouldn't make it to those shelves. And the power grid isn't any better. With aging infrastructure and increasing demand, the risk of power outages is growing. And if an EMP attack or a natural solar storm struck, it could take months or even years to restore full power. Then there's food supply. Today, just four companies control 63% of the grocery retail market, and most operate on a just-in-time system with only a few days' worth of stock on hand. And as if shortages weren't enough, there's control. Digital currencies and tracking devices are giving governments and corporations new ways to limit your access to goods and services. Imagine a world where all your transactions can be traced, and your ability to buy essentials could be turned off with a switch. In short, if you're fully dependent on these systems, you're also at their mercy. Friends, we can't rely on a fragile system. We can't risk only having enough food or water for a few weeks, hoping that life will go back to normal soon. We need to think about long-term self-sufficiency, about being able to live without utterly depending on the system for everything. And that's where sustainable preparedness comes in. For over 20 years, Lisa and I have been helping folks move in this direction, not just with emergency kits, but by giving them the tools to build a lifestyle that's more secure when the system fails, or worse, if it cancels your ability to even buy or sell. Sustainable preparedness means you can produce what you need right where you are for an extended time. So let's look quickly at the basic necessities you'll want to consider. We can't rely on grocery stores that might be emptied overnight. Sustainable preparedness means more than just having a well-stocked pantry. It means being able to grow your own food, preserve it for year-round use, and store it safely without electricity. Think about a garden that produces consistently, having farm-fresh eggs on your table, a root cellar or cool room to keep your vegetables fresh, and the skills and equipment to water bath can, pressure can, dehydrate, or even culture your food. Water is life, and without a stable, independent supply, no plan is going to be complete. You need a permanent water source you can access without relying on municipal systems or the power company. This could mean a well with a backup hand pump, solar power options for pumping water, or capturing spring water. Having a reliable water system can literally make the difference between life and death, so this is one of the first items that you'll want to work on. When it comes to staying warm, the most sustainable and independent solution is wood heat. Unlike other heat sources that rely on external supplies or the grid, wood is both reliable and renewable. You can actually grow your own fuel, and how cool is that? And wood can not only heat your home, but it can also heat your hot water and cook your food for greater independence. For power, renewable energy is key. With a well-designed off-grid power system, you can live very normally, enjoying the same comforts you're used to. 
Solar panels can provide reliable electricity, and if you have a stream, small hydro can add to your power supply. You'll want to learn how to size your system correctly, choose the right equipment, and use it effectively so that you can get dependable energy without breaking the bank. Even if you want to stay on the grid, you can still set up a backup off-grid system for when you lose your power. So how do you make this shift from short-term prepping to sustainable preparedness? That's why we created the Ready Life Academy, a place where you can access the info you need to get started and can get the help you need to keep going. The Academy gives you step-by-step -step training, answers to questions you're bound to have, and the support of real people that understand where you're coming from and are moving in the same direction themselves. This isn't just another online course. This is an entire system designed to help you get started with each step, no matter your current level of experience. You'll have access to video resources on everything from food storage and water systems to growing your own garden and setting up off-grid power. In our course library, we'll walk you step-by-step step through creating a custom food storage system that's tailor-made for your family. You'll learn how to choose and set up a hand pump on your well, or custom designing your own solar power system so it's exactly the right size for your needs. In the course called Your Next Step, you'll even walk step-by-step step through figuring out what your highest priority items are to work on so that way you can put your time and money to the best use. In the Ready Life Academy's content library, you'll get access to vast resources on everything from gardening and food preservation to water systems, wood cook stoves, and what to look for in land or a homestead. And to make it super easy to find what you need, we even have a smart search function that allows you to ask conversational questions and get answers from our massive content library. And it also points you to the exact videos and point in the video where your answer is located. This tool is amazing. And finally, the ingredient that is probably the most important of all. If you're new to all of this, the school of hard knocks can be rough. Why go it alone? Why not have someone with experience that you can get advice from and ask questions of? This really is the number one reason we created the Ready Life Academy, to give folks a place where they can get real help from someone who's been there. In the Academy, you can discuss your questions and plans on regular live coaching calls or get quick help from the community board where we answer all kinds of questions. And right now, because you've been walking with us through this 21-day journey, and you're serious about this, we want to do what we can to make it a reality for you. We can't do everything, but we can teach you how to do this the right way and be there to help you each step of the way. If you have an experienced friend who can do that for you, then by all means, take them up on it. But for those who don't have that option, we want to make it as affordable as possible for you to get started with the help you need. So right now, you can join the Ready Life Academy for less than the cost of dinner out once a month. Just visit thereadylife.com forward slash go and you'll get access to resources you need to create a new sustainable life, a life that reclaims the noble independence our forefathers cherished. Just go to thereadylife.com forward slash go or click the link down in the description. I know the road to sustainable preparedness can seem overwhelming, but that's exactly why we built this academy. You'll get practical help every step of the way and if you're serious about making the next year your year of independence, we're here to help you. Let's make sure you, your family, and your community are as ready as possible for whatever comes next. Thank you for being part of this 521 journey with us. May God be with you as you work toward a life of not just preparedness, but sustainable preparedness.